Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Cross Party Group on uh, on Culture. Um, I'm Joan McAlpine, MSP, convener of the Cross Party Group, and uh, I'm pleased to welcome some other MSPs. Uh, Claire Baker, uh, MSP, who's here. You're all, uh, Claire's also Labour's Culture spokesperson. Uh, are there any other MSPs here that I'm missing? Okay, I'm sure some will, some more will arrive. It's, it's all, there's always a lot of competition. We usually do very well, uh, and sometimes the MSPs are able to, to pop in and out. Um, tonight, the subject that we've agreed to discuss is uh, one step beyond radical futures for cultural freelancers in Scotland. Um, so basically, we're really talking about what barriers to artists and other cultural freelancers face in Scotland and how can we better support them and that's a topic that comes up again and again um, in the cross party group and indeed it's a topic that comes up in the Parliament's uh, Culture Committee actually which I am the convener of and Claire's the deputy convener of. Um, so to, to start us off um, we're going to have a presentation uh, from Janie Nicholl and Ailey Rutherford uh, who run a research project called In Kind uh, charting the hidden economy of the arts in uh, in Glasgow um, I hope I've got that right I'm just going to hand over to them uh, so that you can do your presentation and then we'll go on to the rest of our speakers I think you've all got the agenda here so you'll know who they are but I'll just hand over just now to Janie and Ailey Hi there. Hi, yeah. Just press the red button. So, yeah, my name is Janie Nicholl and I'm a, a visual artist based in Glasgow. Um, I'm former president of Scottish Artists Union and um, last year I teamed up with Ailey Rutherford. On my right? It's on my left. On my left. Uh, and we um, created In Kind, which is a research pro project. Uh, that basically used Glasgow International 2018 as a case study and our, in, our aim was to chart the hidden or below the waterline economies of the visual arts or of GI at least. Um, so charting the unpaid labour, mutual support, favours and volunteer hours that go into making art festivals happen and the apparent success stories that they, they are. Uh, we, were, we were keen to challenge this apparent success this apparently successful arts festival model which is now rolled out over uh, many major cities and asking how sustainable it actually is so the project basically came out of conversations with a range of artists who made it increasingly apparent that the festival's in-kind economy tends to be the elephant in the room and while also being endemic within the art scene in general. So basically GEI um, as a festival actually does fund some of the exhibitions um, that it holds, but um, basically there's 90 exhibitions over 78 different venues and they have an open fund which is about £32,000 and they have one uh, three grand open bursary. Uh, they also have a supported uh, section of the festival, which is about £80,000. And then they have the across the city uh, part of the festival, which we were part of, which is basically you're on your own. So there's no direct funding for that part of GI. So um, basically we were, we were wanting to map um, the, the, the economy of the GI and to try and get a more realistic picture. Uh, so I'll just hand over to Ailey. Um, so one of the things that um, we were drawing on as part of this um, was this idea of the looking at the econ looking at your economy as an iceberg, which is a metaphor that was really coined by a couple of feminist economists called J.K. Gibson Graham. So the idea of that really is that if you imagine your economy as an iceberg, things like paid work, profit-making business, commercial banks, all of that stuff sits above the water level, but things like unpaid labour, domestic work, childcare activism, any kind of unpaid labour really, all sits um, below the water level and that's essentially the kind of unseen economy that, um, but that we need to keep the stuff on the top of float. So we were thinking a lot about how this relates to the economy of the arts, an industry that's really heavily reliant on the unpaid labour of artists. Um, can you put the next slide on for us? Thanks. So, yes, yeah, so for the duration of GI um, this year, we asked artists and other paid 
unpaid workers to log their hours spent on making, organising, planning, installing, invigilating, everything involved in realising the, the work for the exhibitions, projects, events. And we also asked them to, lo to log their out-of-pocket costs. Um, so money spent in order to create their work. Um, we displayed the info in uh, analog ways, which you can see in the slide. So w this was our information kiosk, which we had specially commissioned, um, with objects made to represent unpaid labor, uh, which is the large ball of rope, which gradually got larger and larger over the, the course of the festival, the three week festival. And on the left there, there's tubes with um, ping pong balls um, representing um, different amounts of money. So these gradually went up as well. Um, so the kiosk a acted as a means of gathering um, qualitative and anecdo anecdotal information through conversation with the audience, other practitioners and volunteers. <coughs> And we collaborated also with um, artist Paul Maguire, who works at Glasgow School of Art, um, to create this data visualization, and Andrew Hopkins, another artist, to create an inter interactive website. So basically, artists and people involved in GI were able to log their out-of-pocket costs and their hours worked in real time, and this updated as a visual data visualization uh, updating over the, over the cor course of the festival. Um, to, uh, so basically trying to represent all the, this sort of ongoing, um, the, 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 all these kind of costs. So yeah, so this was shown as part of the festival at CCA, um, at Platform and at Trongate 103. Um, yeah, so although we knew before we started this project that there was going to be a huge amount of unpaid labour going into the festival, um, and that also artists a lot of the time were um, paying out of their own pocket to create their work. There was some pretty startling results, and I think even we were quite surprised by the level of unpaid labour. Um, so, um, one of the <laughs> we were able to kind of estimate totals based on our um, sample size of participants and what we knew to be the the kind of total number of artists participating in GI. So, around about halfway through the project we estimated that the total costs to artists to put on Glasgow International, um, and this is both uh, taking both unpaid labour and actual out-of-pocket costs, was this, the total of that is £1.6 million, which is exactly the same as the estimated total income to the city from um, to the city of Glasgow as, as a result of GI. But absolutely none of that trickles back down to the artists. And I think it just kind of illustrates what a broken economic model we're working with. Um, so as part of the project, we also ran a series of discussion-based and performance events that we, uh, they were aimed to further interrogate issues of artist precarity and trying to open up that debate on how lack of payment in the arts affects lack of diversity in the visual arts in Scotland. So uh, we had an event at CCA called At What Cost, an event at Platform called Who Can Afford to Be an Artist? Strategies for Survival, and a final soapbox event outside Mono in King's Court. Um, can we get the next slide up? Yeah. So with, uh, with so many professional artists working for weeks or even months for free in order to prepare, put on and staff their exhibitions throughout the festival, um, the project reveals the scale and depths of what is really a highly discriminatory economy of free labour within the arts and one which the industry depends on. Uh, the big question is who can afford to be part of an arts festival that requires so much unpaid labour and so who is therefore excluded from partic participating in festivals like GI because they cannot afford to work unpaid. Whose voice does this festival amplify and who does it represent? And basically, who are these festivals for? So there's a quote that we've got here from Dave O'Brien, um, who is an academic working at Edinburgh University. And he was one of the people that um, published the Panic Report, which some of you may have heard of, which was serendipitously coincided with our project. It was, um, it was published last April. Um, so from uh, Edinburgh University, Sheffield University, and an organization called Create London. Uh, so his quote here is, the, the audience for contemporary arts tends to be educated of high social status and white, and those that are producing it broadly match that profile. 
So basically, they were looking at the, the idea of meritocracy within the arts and how it's generally people who are you know, privileged enough to be at the top levels in the art who think they get there through merit alone rather than actually their contacts or who they know or you know, their, their status. Um, anyway, over to Eileen. Yeah, and I guess also who can afford to work on paid. Um, so can we get the last slide up, actually? So um, for our final event, which um, happened in the last weekend of GI, we ran a soapbox where artists could come and have their say on the state of the arts. And as part of this, we read out a list of demands, which were compiled as a result of our discussions and all of the events that we'd um, run through the project and also the conversations that we had um, at the booth with um, other artists who were exhibiting, visitors, and that kind of wider conversation about um, not just GI necessarily, but um, the visual arts in general. Um, so the list of demands was created um, initially um, as part of GI uh, this year, but we've revised it um, through workshops at In Focus, which was a, a, a project that we did with Create London at Barbican, and also more recently at Balancing Act at Kinning Park Complex for Access Web. Um, this list of demands is a kind of evolving list of demands. It's on our website, and if you'd <coughs> like to add to it, edit it, suggest changes or additions, um, please get in touch. Because and we've also we've got some copies that we can give out tonight if anybody would like a copy and wants to speak to us later about things that they think should be on there that aren't. Um, can we just run the data visualisation maybe while we do this? And cool. Um, okay, so. Yeah. Um, here are our list of demands. <laughs> okay. Um, so, could we? Shall we read the demands and then let the data visualisation okay. play? Do we have time for that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. right. We'll maybe just that. pause that. Thanks. Okay. okay. Thank you. Good to know. Um, okay. <laughs> So there's only ten, 10 demands. We'll do alternate. <laughs> we will abolish art hierarchies. Two, we will operate in solidarity with other artists and across sectors, not in competition. We will be honest and transparent if we exploit ourselves by giving our labour for free. And we will actively challenge the culture of unpaid labour that exasperates inequality and only gives a voice to those who can afford to work unpaid. We will push for a base level income for all that, so that everyone who wants to can afford to be an artist. We will stop exploiting ourselves through social media, creating content for Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp and Instagram, and be more aware of who owns the content on these platforms. Artists will refuse to become the gentrifiers of cities. Those of us with the privileges of being male, or white, or cisgendered, or affluent, or able-bodied, or free from caring responsibilities, will actively share power. We will incorporate the real cost of care into all the plans we make. Arts institutions will no longer ask artists to sign contracts demanding that they work unpaid. Artists will not agree to contracts that demand they work unpaid. <laughs> That's that. That's the ten. Um, yeah, we'll maybe just run the data visualisation. So this was constantly while we were um, at GI. This was constantly updating on a daily basis um, through the kind of information that came in through the website. Has anyone got any questions? Just while we we run that. Or. Can I ask, just as a point of clarification, uh, when you, um, the 1.6 million mm -hmm. uh, evaluation of the unpaid labour, was that purely artists' unpaid labour? Because obviously there's a lot of people involved in these festivals that give their time for free, they're, they're not all artists. That was predominant, I would say it's predominantly artists. We did have a couple of GI volunteers who logged their time as well, but often they're artists as well. Mm -hmm. So right. those people who are acting as festival volunteers are usually um, by and large, young people who are kind of looking to establish careers in the visual arts. Mm -hmm. So yeah, ba basically, what we were working with a, a sample, just like any kind of data that you get from any kind of surveys. You're never going to get 100%. Nobody ever can get, a, you know, pretty much can't. It's really difficult to get that. So we knew that with the, roughly the, the sort of percentage that we were getting the stats through from, that we could actually. So it's a project. It was projected totals. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in a way, that's all you can, really, because 
yeah, there's a huge amount of people uh, all contributing in many different ways. So it's actually quite difficult to kind of analyse. So, yeah. Yep. Can I ask about gender? Just male, female? Have you, had you any comments on that? I mean... Um, what, on the kind of gender split? Yeah. Um, we, we didn't ask that question, actually. Um, <laughs> but no, we didn't, we didn't we directly. Didn't. But I suppose we, we are quite aware that there is, a, you know, generally working within the arts, there's a, a very sort of strong gender bias. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the percentages are, but is it some? So I think, um, well, Artist Newsletter, which is obviously a, a kind of UK-wide thing, um, did a survey a few years ago, and I think they reckoned that something around 75% mm -hmm. of people working in the visual arts were female. So well, I think this is a gender issue. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't really, I guess there were so many other things that we were looking at that we, we didn't focus on that, but um, yeah. Um, Rachel Hamilton, MSP, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Jo, what, how, do you um, that, how do you come to that? I mean, I, th I think people will vote with their feet. So if you're from a, a financial background, uh, you know, you're, you're going to, if there's doors shutting through financial background, you're not going to make it into the arts in the first place. So but also, I think it's, I think just to make, I think maybe there's something that we need to make really clear here. So to be to participate in Glasgow International, which, which is a festival which runs for, I think, 21 days in a row, taken in three weekends, um, you need to be able to work for that full run. Now, if that's very, very difficult to do if you're a single parent, if you're working multiple jobs, if you're in a, if you're in a kind of financially precarious situation, if you've got catering responsibilities, like, there are all sorts of reasons why it's very, very difficult to do that and why that, that kind of format platform some voices over others. That, that does clarify. Okay. <laughs> what, you, what you were meaning with regard to the and longevity of that time. Okay. okay. Uh, can I just have been, been asked to say to people, just mind your body language, don't cover your mouth uh, with your hand, <sighs> because then you won't be interpreted properly. Um, well, the gentleman in the second row there, and then the lady here. I'll use the microphone, maybe it helps everyone here. Um, previous speaker opened up the basement door, really. Um, you, you query the, uh, the inter unpaid internships equivalent of for artists, which the government is trying to, trying to close that, that off anyway, where people who can afford not to be paid can engage in activities which are very lucrative and rewarding. Um, the other thing, though, is, um, as I say, the basement door is people below the horizon, people who want to be artists but can't afford to be artists. They don't even have a workspace. Um, a lot of people now live in urban environments where they don't have um, spare garages or workshops or spare rooms. Um, the growth of the men's shed is a typical example, not that I'm promoting the men's shed, because ladies can use that as well, as well as young people. Um, but um, Phoebe Cummings, who received the Women's Hour, yes, I listened to Women's Hour, um, which was arranged by the Arts Council, the Craft Council, Arts Council, and the VNA, Victoria and Albert, won £10,000 recently and she, she was asked what she would do with the money. She said she would improve and perma make permanent her workspace. So I can't underestimate the fact that we need workspaces and I'm trying to promote maker, makers or maker spaces or people where people go and develop ideas, bearing in mind that JCB, Joseph Cummings uh, Barnford, 80 years ago developed his little first digger with a, with a one pound uh, welder, which he bought second hand, and now it's a major international company. Uh, so, from small ideas come big things, but it's part of the problem is people need an opportunity to develop. Thank you. Thanks very much for that contribution. This is the way the, or the evening's formatted is that we're having a brief response to um, the presentation by Ailey and Janie, and then we've got four other panel members uh, who are going to um, have, um, make presentations, and then there's going to be an opportunity for group discussion. Uh, but this lady here in the grey, you had your hand up? Do you want to? And then Claire, and then we'll move on. So I'm a deaf BSL user. <clears throat> and I just wanted to raise the issue of barriers um, for disabled people and deaf people like myself. And I feel like there's even more barriers for us because communication is a, a massive barrier. Um, and for myself and my colleagues, um, that was partly the reason that we set up our collective, Alba Cats. Um, and we're a collective of deaf creatives who have come together to support each other. And again, we're doing this as volunteers. There's more unpaid labour happening there because we felt like arts organisations and cultural organisations 
<clears throat> are used to just dealing with deaf people as audience members, and that's fantastic to have access, but they need to think about us as artists and creatives as well. Thank you very much for that. It was very interesting. Uh, Claire? Um, thank you, Joan. It's a really interesting mm -hmm. report. It's a good collection of, of data. Is there any examples in Scotland or internationally where there's a different approach to artists and, and funding, where it is, uh, there's more opportunity for a wider range of people to be involved and it's supported financially? Fest I mean, like specifically festivals or... Um, I mean, I think one of the reasons that we... One of the things that we talked about when we made our proposal to look at GI as a case study was that we weren't necessarily trying to just pick apart GI. We were always kind of saying like, that actually this is endemic across the visual arts. And um, I think somebody's going to talk later about the Scandinavian example, actually, but I, I think this is a fairly wide problem in this... Um, issue of there being a lack of diversity in the arts is it's it's pretty across the board um and also but i think there's a real need to rethink these kind of um like international festival models because a lot of them and gi is not the worst um there's a lot of festivals that are really like very heavily reliant on unpaid labor and actually exploitation of artists and yeah it's it's a major problem GI, like gi is not alone in this Okay, thanks very much. I know that some of the comments are going into the wider discussion, mm -hmm. so I think we'll move on and hear from our panellists, and that will give us more time for the wider discussion. But thanks very much, Janie and Ailey. That was really fascinating, really interesting. Yes. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so I'd like to invite um, Cassie Rain, who is going to speak to us about parents and carers and performing arts. Hello, um, nice to be here. Thanks very much for inviting me. Um, my name is Cassie Rain. I am one of the co-founders of Parents and Carers in Performing Arts. We are a relatively new organisation, we're three years old, and we aim... Oh, just please speak. <laughs> is that better? I'm an actor, I thought I was projecting. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, should I just start again? Yes, I should, okay. Um, hello, my name is Cassie Rain. I am the one of the co-founders of Parents and Carers in Performing Arts. We are an organisation that raises awareness of the challenges facing parents and carers in the theatre, music and dance sectors. We're a relatively new organisation, we're three years old. Uh, when we first started, we didn't know if this was an issue. Parents and carers, it wasn't really talked about, certainly not in the performing arts. Uh, we held a meeting which was hosted at the Young Vic in London. We had over 400 people showed up and 70 babies. And, uh, and it was a hot, a heated and passionate debate. And it was definitely an issue. And then um, we set up as a consortium of 18 organisations with, uh, with partners including Equity, Beck2, um, UK Theatre, the Old Vic was our lead organisation for the consortium, and we very quickly began to gather momentum, something that we were very aware of with both freelancers and the self-employed, is that there is a lot of anecdotal evidence, but there is very little data. And especially with parenting and caring, there is, it, it can be quite emotive, but it's, but it's very difficult to quantify the issues, to really know what the issues are, and then, in order to be able to determine a solution, you need to know really what the problem is, what the barriers are and the challenges that you're facing. So we made a conscious decision early on that everything that we do has to be rooted in fact and data. Um, there, is, there is a real need for benchmarked data so we can continue to monitor the situation. Um, we, this year, we undertook our second research project, the Balancing Act project, and it was in partnership with Birkbeck University. And the aim of the project was to investigate the relationship between caring responsibilities and career progression. Um, so, we surveyed over 2,551 people. And just for the purposes of, of this event, I'm just going to I'm going to really focus on the on the freelance on the freelance sector. Um, so you can see 54% of our workforce who responded were freelance. 54% um, 
and it fluctuates, but 54% of the performing arts workforce is freelance, compared to 15% of the general population. This is a, it's a, it's a very unique, very unique workforce. Um, you can see here that we've got freelance by gender. That figure, I'm not wearing my glasses, is seven, nearly 70% are female freelance by gender. And then freelance by caring responsibility, over half of freelancers, over half of those people who had caring responsibilities are freelance. Nearly 28% work full-time and 16% part-time. But what you can see is that a huge, a huge proportion of the freelance workforce has caring responsibilities and that that actually for many could potentially be a way of strategizing, a way of continuing to work with, whilst, whilst having caring responsibilities. So we also were keen to, cover, to, to collate data on the income in the performing arts. So you can see here that the median income, we decided to go with median because there are so many uh, self-employed, particularly workers who are on a low income, that we, we didn't want that to be skewed by those at the very top, by the, the, the few who, who earn a lot. So we went for the median income rather than the average income. So you can see median for full-time is 30K. Median for carers is 20K. And then as you go down, you've got the median for freelancers, which is 16. And the median for carers working freelance, which is 15,000. And we actually found that those who are on the lowest pay or, or have, the, have the lowest income are performers. And they are at 12,000 pounds per year um, and often and freelance. So what we can see is a, a salary sacrifice of, um, so that 15K for freelancers is £3,000 less than the UK living wage. 37% um, of our respondents said that their wages rarely, never or rarely covered their typical outgoings and 64% said they never or rarely covered unexpected expenses. People with caring responsibilities have m many more unexpected um, outgoings that you, can't, that you can't provide for necessarily. So we asked, we asked everybody if they had turned down work due to caring responsibilities. So what we can see here is that 85% of freelancers had turned down work due to caring responsibilities. Um, this was followed by part-time workers and then full-time workers. And we also identified that 40% of carers want to work more, but are unable to attend auditions or interviews on a regular basis. So we, are in a, so we're in a, so we have a workforce who wants to work more, but currently isn't supported in order to be able to, be able to, to do that. And if we think about the percentage of our workforce that is freelance, that is a significant number of people. Um, so we have also looked at what are, some, what are the kind of particular, what are the particular challenges for carers and parents in our industry? Um, there is, there's a lot of last minute engagements um, I think one of the, well, my last touring job before I had children, I think I had the audition on the 8th of December, and by the 12th of December I was in full-time rehearsals and then I was away for a year. And obviously with, with caring responsibilities that would be, that would be very challenging. And there's also the, the late nights, the long hours, last minute, and the travel that you need. Um, we can see here again, it is the self-employed with the 83% who are frequently con confronted with last minute engagements or commitments. Um, although employees, you know, it's not, it's not nothing, it's still 62%. So the impact of this is that we have a workforce, particularly the self-employed workforce, who are struggling to maintain their careers in the performing arts. So of all the people who responded to our survey, and of those who left the industry, 43% said that they left the industry due to caring responsibilities. And this isn't just parenting, it's caring, it's, it's sandwich caring. 
you know, where, where you have uh, caring responsibilities for older people as well as younger people at the same time. And, and it's actually, as an industry, it is, it, it's potentially weakening our resilience if we don't find ways that we can support and retain this workforce to continue doing the jobs that they have devoted significant parts of their lives to. So, the next slide is interesting because for me it touches on something else that we've already, we, we've already talked about, which is, for me, what this demonstrates is the extent to which people are reliant on various forms of social capital in order to continue their career in the performing arts. You can see here the biggest, the biggest numbers, the, 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 the blue bits there, they, they rely on supportive family and networks, supportive partners. These are, you know, so, so if you're a single parent, if you have any other, if you face any other kind of social challenge or disadvantage, caring responsibilities can often be the nail in the coffin that you just, you know, if you've been hanging on for, for, for an amount of time, <clears throat> it really can be the final straw. And then when you have dependents who you care about, then that, you're pulled in too many directions and, it, and it's not tenable. So... The, the final bit of data I'd like to share with you is, um, is around shared parental leave because whilst the previous chart was about what people are doing themselves in order to be able to stay and work, this is, about, this is about the things that we can do to support them and shared parental leave is key. So I think what we're really interested today in it is, is the bottom two lines. And what you can see there is that 74% of people say that if they are self-employed, they would take shared parental leave if it was available. Currently, it's not available to the self-employed. So what that means is that if you... It sends a very clear message about whose responsibility it is to look after children. It's basically... If, if you are a man, there is no paternity allowance. If you want to um, have support... Um, I phoned the job centre and, and my husband would have had to come out of his self-employed status and sign on for a period of time in order to look after our children. So the, the positive news about this as well is that there is an equal number of men and women who, want to, who, who would take shared parental leave. There is a huge appetite for this in the performing arts. And this, for me, could be one of the keys towards achieving equality. They have a model in Scandinavia um, where they have a, a use it or lose it policy. Five months of your shared parental leave has to go to the father or you lose it. I think it's, I think it's food for thought. And just, you know, just to finish on very quickly, I just wanted to say that one of the things that we have identified is that it is hardest for people when they are, when the children in particular are young when they are one, two years old. The way that we work in our industry, it relies on networking, it relies on, on, on keeping connected, it relies on knowing who's doing what, when they're doing it, you need to still be in the room. And, um, and, and there isn't currently childcare support for people with young children. From three years old, it gets much easier. And then as you go on, it gets easier when they go to school. And there are different challenges, but when they're very little, you know, it's very hard to, to get that support, especially if you're freelance. It. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Cassie. That was very interesting. Um, we now have uh, Emma Jean Park, who's a practitioner, and you are an IETM network member. What is that? Um, it's the. In, it's now the, the network for contemporary performing practice in right. Europe, but it used to stand for the informal European theatre meeting. Okay, right. Theatre really meaningful. Thank you for that. Right. Um, so I, I, I knew that, it just slipped my mind for a minute. <laughs> to be okay. fair, it's a tongue twister at best. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Emma Jean Park. Um, so I am also a dancer and theatre maker, working under the creative handle Cultured Mongrel, and I am an associate artist with the Scottish Mental Health Arts Festival that is an unpaid advocacy role. Um, I facilitate Federation of Scottish Theatres working towards well-being sessions. They are a new initiative geared towards improving the mental health and well-being of practitioners in the performing arts. And I work nationally, internationally and recently on a far more local level in my home region of Dumfries and Galloway. And as such, I can only represent a perspective from a performance sector which is largely not possible without subsidy. Um, as a wee disclaimer, 
I produce a non-profit making product. Um, I believe in the arts play a massively important role in society. I believe in a fully subsidised arts sector. I don't believe in them and us politics. And I have far more trust in actions than I do in policy. Um, so everything I speak will be from that point of view. And I could argue my reasons for that. But hopefully, if you can accept that as a point of view, the conversation will be far more progressive. My other slight disclaimer is I'm deeply working class. So often passion can be confused for aggression. And I would ask you <laughs> to forgive me that. It's really true. Um, so since graduating in 2007, I have never been employed. Um, I'm often told I'm lucky to have made a living pursuing my craft. And I do feel totally privileged um, to somehow be able to survive doing this. But I genuinely don't know how much longer I will be able to do it, because after years of long hours, low pay, and increased expectation, this year I have been suffering from absolutely paralyzing anxiety. Um, my love of what I do has not waned. I have a stronger practice than ever. I've become far more articulate in terms of my needs as a practitioner. And reluctantly, I've worked really hard to become more entrepreneurial. Um, yet, I'm totally exhausted and becoming less resilient by the day, with resilience seemingly being the backbone of the creative sector and the freelance sector. Um, there have been loads of mental health impact studies regarding freelance working, but the more research I personally undertake, the more I have to question these studies because their definition of a freelancer doesn't seem to parallel with my lived experience. Perhaps a model that better represents the work of a cultural freelancer is a zero hours contract. My employer does not have to guarantee me any hours of paid work. Arguably, the benefit is I can turn down work offered to me, but I'm also yet to meet a cultural freelancer who doesn't feel the need to say yes if someone's given them a little bit of money. Um, however, unlike a zero hours contract, I'm guaranteed no statutory rights, no sick pay, no paid annual leave, and no genuine protections against discrimination. The impacts of zero hours contracts on mental health are far more well documented, with Cambridge University's latest research stating, so-called flexi contracts, none of which can provide a living, allow low level management unaccountable power to dictate workers' hours and consequent income to a damaging extent that is open to severe incompetence and abuse. As such, more and more, creative entrepreneurship is being pushed upon freelance artists, suggesting it's possible to make a profit from what we do. However, if Matthew Bourne, arguably the producer of the most digestible and viable contemporary dance there is, currently receives £1.3 million of subsidy per year, I don't know how a project where, as an artist, I am trying to rescale theatre to living room performances for people with immunodeficiency and anxiety disorders will ever be sustainable. And that's a project I think needs to happen because those people aren't coming to our buildings anytime soon. Distressingly, there is also still little clarity for establishing how freelancers are paid. For example, for this event, and I do appreciate it, I am being paid £50 plus travel expenses, which might seem reasonable at just under £25 per hour. But I've been here for three hours, because I arrived at five to get through security, and I've spent approximately four or five hours preparing, and that isn't including informal chats I've had with other peers or the administration undertaken to finalise the arrangements, which gratefully was actually relatively low. Um, which means for about eight hours work, I'm being, prob being paid probably £6.25 an hour, which is two thirds of the Scottish living wage. And I'm sitting here doing it. So can you imagine when people are unaccountable out with this building, what I'm being paid? Um, this negates the increasing rates of membership fees, for example, for IETM, which apparently is a great thing I should herald, um, insurance, storage spaces for props, website costs, which I have to design myself. That is why it is so poor. I'm sorry if you're on there. I'm doing my best. And not starting to mention pensions or any way of surviving. Um, it also negates unpaid time for writing applications. Creative Scotland's latest touring fund was designed to challenge the unpaid hours spent writing subsidy applications. Yet, having timed them, it took me over 125 hours to complete that application. Anyone that you speak to in dance knows that I've, I've worked hard and I've not mastered application writing, but I'm one of the people more skilled in it. 125 hours, and that's not including the 10 years of prep work that are the conversations which make me feel confident enough to fill that out. Creative Scotland says, the subsidised arts sector is highly regarded both in Scotland and across the world. It is hugely influential in supporting creative industries and tourism, which together employ nearly 300,000 people. 
It provides a fulcrum for Scottish, Scotland's wider creative industries growth, which contributed £4.6 billion to the economy in 2015, up 23.6% from 2014. I'm not totally sure what this means. In any sector meeting I've attended, cultural growth translates to financial growth. But if my lived experience is anything to go by, as discussed above, this is created on the backs of people who are struggling. It's the equivalent of using people in zero hours contracts to justify statistics for decreased unemployment. It's presenting the facts in a consciously biased way. I was also asked here today to present policy solutions to the issues I've experienced in my career, some of which I've raised. However, in truth, the issues I face on a daily basis that have not improved over my decade of working cannot be cured by policy. They're a question of ethics and professionalism. And quite frankly, if policy could genuinely address unethical and professional practice, the Westminster government would maybe not be the greatest show in panto season in 2018. <laughs> it's no surprise to me that the Me Too movement has been clung to so vigorously by the arts sector, because any chance to address the historic power imbalance that exists feels so precious, before even more of the bottom-run cultural freelancers are slowly destroyed by the trickle-down pressures that they face. A friend who composes for theatre once joked with me that Alcoholics Anonymous is one of the greatest networking opportunities in Scottish theatre. It could be true, but it's really not a joke. Underpinning it all lies the same research that connects poverty, instability and a lack of validation as a human being connected to ill mental health. Um, and I'd like to add that I'm saying this from the perspective of a white, cisgendered, able-bodied Scottish woman. I can't begin to fathom how people face an additional barriers. People of colour, people from the trans and non-binary community who are proven within society to face an increased risk of ill mental health. I don't know how they are finding the strength to continue and hats off to anyone who really is. Um, it can feel petty to demonstrate some of the ways in which unethical practice are undertaken and in the ways I witness quite regularly, but one I will use is that I am still waiting on £2,000 worth of payment for a project I completed in June. On average, one in four emails about this project are now responded to. This tells me I'm becoming a hassle getting in touch and that maybe I don't deserve to be paid. I'm one of those I make about £12,000 a year people and I've already paid my collaborator. So technically I'm three months wages out of pocket. I genuinely don't know how I make it to the end of the year. Possibly because this week I've been back to my mum's to do my washing and get a good feed. I'm in my thirties. I recognise that those working in organisations are largely stretched and that people want to listen. That's why I'm here. Um, and that most genuinely care about cultural freelancers but feel limited by their role. As I said at the beginning, I don't believe the situation is them and us, but I do believe the system is broken and cleverly pushes this narrative so that we spend our days being angry with each other instead of engaging with the broader political sphere that we need to turn if anyone in the country is going to lead a more supported and sustainable life. Finally, as someone who doesn't believe it's possible to speak on behalf of my sector, um, I can only speak for myself. Prior to this, I asked loads of my peers as unpaid consultants to propose policy solutions. Some of these are well formed, some could do with some brilliant governmental minds working with the word. Um, formed ones. Cultural free freelancers will be paid within seven days of submitting their invoice. Rates for cultural freelancers will be calculated to reflect proposed working hours. Cultural freelancers' rates of pay will increase with inflation. Artistic organisations will ensure 50% of their salary spend is spent on practising artists a 50% artist and 50% admin policy. Working towards a universal basic income for artists is referenced in the Scottish Government's cultural strategy. A mortgage policy which enables cultural freelancers to move onto the property ladder and out with precarious living circumstances. Cultural freelancers will have clear access to flexible pension schemes that understand freelance employment as well as access to annual leave, sick leave and parental leave benefits. Cultural events will not spend more money on merchandising or hospitality than they do on cultural freelancers unless the cultural freelancers are employed and fully reimbursed for the time they spend on those events. Other policies, which could do with a bit of improved wording, 
a national policy for and process for reporting unethical practice, a tax credit system that is amended to reflect the actual working life of cultural freelancers and their fluctuating incomes. Government childcare provision, recognising flexible working processes, reflecting the real cost of childcare and not varying depending on a parent's access to public or private providers, whilst also offering emergency childcare with ease. A greater infrastructure developed in rural areas, namely transport links, affordable travel and broadband to enable rural cultural freelancers similar access to networks as those in the central belt. Ensuring that more money is invested in people than in maintaining offices which have no heritage or cultural significance. More efficient application pro processes for public funding that challenge the unpaid, unpaid time of application writing, often written by artists who are not skilled in such a formal approach. A policy to remove the obsession with the new and encourage investment in established or deepening practice. A policy to ensure those working for salaries within publicly funded organisations remain curious about what people are doing out with their venue and their own arts bubble, and a policy of accountability for those who do not meet their ethical obligations. I'm an artist, so I can propose those things without intelligent wording or imagining how they would be implemented, but I know that implementing them would make my resilience stores amplify massively, and I may still be sitting here in 10 years if some of that comes to action. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Emma Jane. Uh, we now have Maria Oller of Longha. Thank you very much. Um, I have been asked to talk about uh, freelance artists in Scandinavia or Finland and Sweden, which I'm focusing on. Uh, I have been Scottish for 20 years, uh, but my accent <coughs> is still Finnish. So if there's something you don't understand, please just ask. Um, the Scandinavian countries are big, with few people in them and big dis distances between theatres. So, to survive, the theatres to survive, they need financial input from the state and, um, and the local government. So they are heavily subsidised by the state and by the local governments. And I would like to read um, a mission from the Swedish Theatre Alliance, how they think about freelance artists, <coughs> and specifically actors in this case. The basic idea is that state-supported theatre belongs to the public sector. It follows, therefore, that it is the will of society that actors be employed, even though the profession consists of high percentage of freelancers. This entails that society takes responsibility for the basic security and continuity of, of established freelance actors. So this means that um, with a little bit of background, uh, there are more work because of the, the theatres are subsidised by the state. Uh, for example, in Finland, there are 14 state-funded theatres by law. So there's a theatre law where they, are, they get their funding from. Then there are 30 state-funded on shorter term, which is sort of uh, regular funded organisations from our point, from Creative Scotland's scheme. And 74 free groups funded regularly, and totally 150 free groups who are project-funded. So this is, there's a, there's a lot more work in that way. But um, in Finland, for example, um, the members of the Actors' Union, 65% are freelance, freelance there. And um, families in general in Finland are 40% freelance workers, but when the art sector, it's 44%. So there's more people in, in 
the art sector who are freelance, which is quite normal here as well. Uh, single parent families in Finland, 21% of families in Finland are single parent, but <coughs> freelancers are 22%, so it's not a huge difference there. 37.5% of freelance uh, performers earn less than 2,000 a month, euros. 30% earn between 2,000 and 3,000 a month, and 30% earn at least 3,000 euros a month. So that means that it's, it's, it's not hugely well paid, but it's, it's, it's quite substantially well paid. Um, and the uh, state-supported theatres um, have usually a, an ensemble of, a, of a, a core group of actors, but then they bring in freelance actors to, to the ensemble. Uh, in Finland also actors, freelance actors who are not continuously employed are seen as job seekers. And as freelance, we are looking for jobs all the time. So it's not uh, a question of shame or a question of not being good enough to be part of be a job seeker. That is part of being a freelance. So for the days you are working, you get paid. For the days you are not working, you get uh, a job seeker's allowance plus income-related uh, allowance. Then depends on if you have children, that is then added. You get a little bit extra for, for how many children you got. Um, when you work as a freelance in Finland, uh, both you and the employer have some, you need to pay tax, of course, insurance, uh, but that is the employer who pays the insurance. Uh, pension, uh, it's compulsory for the employer to pay pension and for you to pay pension. Employer pays 17.75% and the employee pays 6.65%. Uh, you also have to pay into an unemployment fund. Uh, with the unemployment fund, the employer pays in 2.4% of the fee and the employee pays 1.9 percent. And national insurance, the employer pays, pays 0.86 percent and the employee 1.53 percent. So it's about 20 percent. The employer pay about 20 percent in compulsory payments from the fee the, the freelancer gets. But this means that there is a security Whatever work a freelance artist does, there you get uh, pension, you get sick <coughs> pay, you get, um, you get uh, unemployment, um, income-related unemployment benefits from that. So this means that um, you, you are valued you feel valued as, as a freelance artist and you are not left, left alone. Also, also the um, um, what do you call it? child uh, uh, paid by um, what, um, maternity leave, paternity leave is income related for freelancers as well as for employed. Uh, in Sweden they have something called the Theatre Alliance, and they have a dance alliance, they have a, a music, musicians alliance, which means that this organization is employing, not employing, but they, they take on artists who then uh, get their, when they are not in work, they get their benefits or their um, yeah, they're, they're sort of support, financial support from them. And when they are working, 
they don't get it. So it's, that is just a different kind of organization, similar to being a, a job seeker in Finland. Um, then I looked at pay for, um, uh, for freelance artists, and there is a minimum payment for actors, for example, when they take on work, which is 187 euros per performance, and 50% that for rehearsals, and then they get 12% holiday pay, but, and also something called holiday money, which is 50% of the holiday pay. And that is coming from an old tradition that you give money, a little bit of extra money, so the people can have a holiday, and then you get a little bit extra when they come back, so they definitely will come back after the holiday. <laughs> but freelancers don't get the other bit that when you come back from work. Um, when a freelance actor is going on tour, both in Sweden and Finland, is the theatre who is organising and paying for the accommodation, travel and per diems. So if, if you work, even if it's for an hour, you work further away than 50 kilometres from your home, you get a per diem. And um, yeah, so that is, but, but they are taxed. So the, the freelance artists need to pay a tax on, on this. So it, in a way, it's the freelance artist needs to pay more in, in social security uh, payments, which are compulsory, and, and uh, also more tax. But on the other hand, the freelance artists, I feel, get the support the, the safety net is there, and allowed to be an artist, not having to work in, in, in a cafe or something between works, can focus on finding work. And also, what I find, um, that you can take risks. And as an artist, I think it's so important to be able to take risks. And if you, if you don't have the safety net behind you, you start you start being cast in so the type cast, and then your world becomes smaller and smaller and smaller as an artist. So that is that. I have I have more things here, but I think this is now for now, and I can then answer questions if you have. I'm not an expert in this. I'm just a freelance artist, <laughs> but um, I have I have got some information. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Miriam. And our final panel speaker um, is Robin Patel from Ergadia. Welcome, Robin. Right, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for having me. Um, yep, and my name is Robin Patel. Um, I'm from Ergadia Heritage. We are basically a consortium of heritage professionals and freelancers um, working throughout Scotland. Um, I've been asked to come along today to really look at the, the things that are really needed to support heritage freelancers within the sector uh, and to potentially look at some of the common threads I think a lot of the panellists have identified tonight that actually bring together the different sectors in terms of the experience of freelance work. Um, so instead of me representing the sector, which I don't think I could possibly ever do, I did what I would be expected to do, which is to go to freelance, sorry, go to Twitter um, and, and go to social networking and ask the question, um, you know, what do you need to help you thrive within the sector? And I got a few responses back. Um, the top kind of comment was the ability to bend one's knees, uh, the ability to actually work uh, flexible across projects. The other comment was be careful with your free time and your pro bono work. Um, I would say that probably my daily fee, um, I would divide that by maybe four or five or multiply it by four or five before I actually finish off a project. So on the face of it, when you explain to your colleagues that you're a freelance consultant and they ask you, what's your daily fee? The response is, oh, that's quite good, actually. That's not too bad. But actually, the reality is 
when you actually have to deliver these projects, you have to multiply it by, by at least five times. When you add in your pro bono time and you look at, obviously, the minimum wage for that, you end up realising that you're actually working for a lot less than the minimum wage. So on a weekly basis, I probably work about 50 hours. Um, 20 of those hours are probably looking for other contracts and forging partnerships and exploring projects. Um, the other 30 hours are probably delivering on those projects. Um, but as I say, we're Argadia, we are a group of heritage consultants. We bring together people from different professions. So we work with architects, we work with artists and designers, we work with musicians and filmmakers, we'll work with anyone who we think can join us on certain projects. And that's the kind of approach that we've taken. Um, but I suppose the big question that I've got for all of the freelancers around this table tonight and in, in the audience, who actually does this by choice? Did you actually choose to become consultants? Did you become, choose to become freelancers? Because there's certainly in my sector anyway a huge job um, um, there, there isn't enough jobs, basically. Uh, there, there, are, there are a handful of jobs that are advertised in the national press on a weekly basis, and they're highly competitive. Um, they basically rely on you having a postgraduate qualification. They rely, you, rely on you basically having a substantial level of experience, and they certainly rely on you knowing the right people. I mean, let's be absolutely honest about this. So looking at that, um, I actually almost gave up in the sector. Uh, I'd been working in the sector for about five years, um, working throughout different contracts. You have to go across Scotland. You can't just stay in the one location. You have to go where the work is. And I ended up travelling across Argyll, hence becoming Argadia. But towards the end of my, I suppose, my spiritual journey, I had to settle down. I got married and I started to have a family. And I simply couldn't afford to work in heritage. So I ended up working for the man. I ended up working for Arnold Clark on a well-paid job that was basically making use of my skills from the heritage sector. I was absolutely miserable. I was earning enough money to get on by, but it just wasn't for me. And then all of a sudden, knock, knock on my mobile phone, I had the tap of a freelance opportunity. And that's where I took the leap. And it's a leap of faith for a lot of people. Some people can't even afford to take that risk. But if you do take that risk, then it can pay off. Unfortunately for me, it has paid off. And that's possibly because I've spent 50 hours a week continuously looking for work and opportunities. And we have just been lucky enough to ride the wave of this changing landscape of heritage. It's no longer about just museums and galleries and exhibitions. It's about community empowerment. It's about working with communities to use the crucible of heritage to deliver a real difference within those communities. So we've worked with communities to deliver these projects, and that's what we do as Argadia. We enable local community organizations to deliver the positive change through heritage. Um, coming back to my kind of consultation that I initially did with the sector. Um, bending of the knees and be careful of pro bono time was, was basically the, the two main things that came out. But equally so was the fact that when you go to conferences, it's always the same people. It's the people that can afford to go to conferences. When you go to training, it's always the, the same people that you see during training sessions. It's the people that can afford to do training. Training is really, really expensive. But more expensive than that is even just attending conferences to meet the people so you can garnish the contracts, which will give you a better future, hopefully. So there's a huge access issue with even just breaking through the mould and trying to get into these networks. The networks are not accessible. The second thing on that is, as a freelancer, you have to pay for absolutely everything. Your camera equipment, your laptops, your travel, everything. You can't just go to a stationary cupboard and pick out your, your artist materials. You can't go to a stationary cupboard and pick up a laptop. You have to pay for absolutely everything. And you don't get a tax break on that. There is no support to do that. So whilst you're pitching for contracts and projects that seem like quite good, you know, a six month contract for like, you know, six thousand pounds seems doable. You end up having to pay out all of your travel expenses, your laptop costs, your internet costs, everything. Whereas in a, in a normal paid um, contract job, either full time, part time, permanent, temporary, it doesn't matter. You usually get some kind of practical support, and freelancers don't have that in the sector. 
So I would like to explore that as an opportunity. What can be done to actually deliver practical support for freelancers? We're not talking necessarily about giving us cash. It's about working with people who develop products and sell products that could actually support the work that we do. The second thing is really access to networking events. One of the, the projects that we did as Argadia last year was working in partnership with Historic Environment Scotland and the University of St Andrews to do a review of cultural, um, sorry, community heritage within Scotland. And I was going to say cultural heritage, but that's the wrong term. Um, and, and what we found that the majority of the sector is purely driven by the will of people. It's purely driven by the volunteer sector. The majority of the heritage sector is driven by volunteers. And that is a strength in the sense where people are able to take risks and they're able to express a viewpoint without fear of you know, political repercussions. But it's also a tragedy because it means that these community heritage organisations don't have the adequate support to deliver difference within their communities. So we work as consultants and we try and get them off the bottom rung. We try and get them to get into their stalled spaces, to transfer property into their name. And then from that point, we try and get them to be sustainable, more resilient organisations. But our time is only limited. And as I said, you know, a lot of my time is pro bono. And I ended up, for some reason, becoming a museum mentor for four museums across Scotland. A lot of my colleagues are saying, what are you playing at? Why are you doing that? The only reason I do that is because I know that my skills could potentially be used to at least channel some kind of support for these organisations and get them off the ground or perhaps do some fundraising for them. So a lot of my work is pro bono. Um, but if I was asked, would I take a permanent job over doing what I do at the moment? Hell no. And the reason for that is because as a consultant, as a freelancer, I'm not tied politically to any local authority. I can actually champion the interests of local groups and voices without having to be worried about the political agendas of local authorities or larger organisations. Um, so local authorities will approach myself and Argaria to actually do community consultation exercises, for example. A whole realm of work that I wouldn't have even expected Heritage to be involved with. We do a lot of community engagement and consultation. The evidence of which, and we've seen a lot of it actually today by the panellists tonight, the evidence of which would hopefully raise the eyebrows of, of the Scottish Government to actually make policy change. Without the data... Nobody is going to believe what we're saying. So we have to continuously engage, not just as freelancers, but with um, the communities in which we work with as well to realise the value of heritage work. Um, I'm not entirely sure if this has done, been done before, but this doesn't seem to have been a, a survey of freelance workers within the cultural heritage and art sector. We are doing our own thing. We're doing community heritage, we're working with artists, and we're doing our own individual surveys. There doesn't seem to be a joined up collaborative survey of the sector, and it would be really interesting to see what data came out from that. I suspect a lot of it is very similar. When we were looking at some of the, the wage gaps there, and when we were looking at some uh, of the wage data, yeah, I totally see that. That is exactly what heritage freelancers face as well. But we're not talking amongst each other as much as we possibly could. Um, when we look at things like the draft culture strategy, um, whilst I see that it, you know, it, there needs to be adequate scope for whatever culture is, and, and certainly the expressive arts, the, the heritage voices seems to be in slightly left out from that. Um, we are kind of viewing this as a kind of hierarchical approach that needs to be really addressed. Even within this chamber tonight, we are part of a structure, we are part of a perceived hierarchy. We need to really address that. Um, we need to go back into our communities and say, well, as freelancers, we can enable you to do these things, but um, what do you actually need to have a greater voice at a governmental level? Um, and I feel that the current format of creating policies and grand vision statements isn't going to be enough practical change for the sector. Um, but there's also an employability within heritage as well, a huge employability issue. There is a lot of people coming out of University of St Andrews courses and Stirling University, and they're all high caliber graduates. And in fairness, sectors like the Historic Environment Scotland, Museums Guy Scotland are doing a lot of good work in terms of paid internships. 
but we are literally seeing thousands of people paying for or applying for a handful of internships. And I've spoken with some of them. And when you see their photographs, you know exactly what kind of background they're coming from. I mean, let's be honest about it. Everyone is middle class. Everyone is affluent. Everyone can afford to do these kind of jobs. And sometimes the interns already have 10 years experience. They're not engaging with school leavers. They're not engaging with people that are going through colleges. They're not engaging with people of a different social economic background to the ones that are coming out through further and higher educational establishments. So that needs to be looked at as well. An internship program is only a temporary solution as well. It doesn't seem to actually deliver a long-term solution for the sector. Hence why I've ended up working in freelance. There simply isn't enough jobs out there. Um, and um, the only way that I've personally survived is by looking at heritage beyond, as I was saying, museums and galleries and more towards social enterprises. And that's definitely the route I think that artists are going down as well, working with social enterprises that are either in existence or helping communities to set them up. So the social enterprise model is incredibly interesting to look at and it's where I think heritage, culture and arts regularly meets and enterprise as well. Um, the, 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 the draft cultural strategy at the moment, I, don't, I, I think it kind of like only, is only a drop in the ocean compared to the reality of the actual sector. There's some quantification there that is kind of needs to be really just fleshed out a wee bit more. There's a lot more than 5,000 social enterprises in Scotland. There's a lot more um, cultural heritage organisations that might not even be registered at, as charities. There are groups and organisations that are actively coming together and being disbanded that don't become official charities, but they, they end up doing great work within their communities. So, for example, if, if there's an organisation that does work with a prison service that's inspired by heritage cookery, that does a project for like six months and then disbands, does that come into the statistics and where does that go and where does the learning come from that type of project? So I think there's a lot more work to do to get, actually get a more accurate picture of the sector. And within that, there's a lot of temporary workers and freelancers and project officers that will work on these projects. What happens to them after they leave these projects? Where do they end up going? What kind of career paths have they taken? Again, personally, I work with architects. I work with um, archaeologists. I work with artists. My career path just basically zigzags constantly depending on the project that I work on. But I'm not sure that what I do is actually recorded in any way as part of government statistics. And I don't think freelancers are recorded as part of government statistics really that accurately at all. If I'm off sick, I think a lot of us talked about this. Uh, my, my wife's just had a child um, and she was fortunate enough to be able to take a year off. Um, I am constantly freaking out about where my next um, salary, my next income is going to come from all the time. Um, the only reason why um, it's kind of worked out for me personally at the moment is because I'm at home looking after the, the baby a lot of time while she goes back to work. Um, but that we can't afford to, to say in this whatsoever. And uh, if she falls sick and I fell sick, or if I fell sick, then there would be no support for the family at all and we'd be in serious trouble. Um, I can't take any time off work. Um, I can't go on holidays. Um, I have no insurance. Um, apart from, obviously, um, business insurance. But I have no insurance if I fall sick. Um, and um, there's no kind of um, job, I suppose, perks for being a freelancer. So um, at the moment, kind of, Argadia is growing. We're looking to engage with artists and, and, and bring people into our consortium. We're working with local heritage organizations and artists and local communities. And we're constantly looking to expand. One of the things we're trying to do at the moment is become a community interest company and, and, and go down that route. Um, we don't think that there's probably enough support for startups in the sector. So for example, if there are groups of artists that are coming together or heritage freelancers, and we want to do an, create an organization or create some kind of product, we're not sure of the business support that's out there to actually help us launch these things. Um, so that's another thing that we'd like to see developed in the sector, some kind of business support. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of like coming back to the consultation just to summarize things up. Um, there's a lack of networking. There's a lack of uh, practical support. Um, and if you're able, then you're lucky 
If you're able to work as a freelancer, then you're pretty lucky. Um, but if you're not able to work as a freelancer and you want a job in Heritage, then it's unlikely um, <coughs> that you're going to have a permanent job <coughs> and it's unlikely that you'll stay in the sector for a long period of time. Um, and that's kind of my perspective. So, thank you. Thank you very much to all our uh, panellists. Um, I think the, to touch on the, the Robin's point at the end there, I think we're, we're kind of seeing a start of a conversation, even though this has been a, an issue that is obviously, as, as your lived experience shows, has is, is, is been an issue in the sector for a, a long, long time. But it's, uh, it's, I think now we're actually beginning to focus on it um, in terms of when our committee, the Culture Committee, uh, looked at the regular funding uh, row around um, uh, Creative Scotland last year. I think some of the people that wrote to us, it came across very strongly, all the stuff that you were talking about and how difficult it is for cultural freelancers and artists uh, to survive and how we need to have a better, a better system there. But I think what you're saying is that we need, we need to start by collecting data. We just don't know enough about it. And I think it was really interesting to hear uh, the, the data that uh, Ailey and Janie and Cassie uh, had, had collected and, uh, and how that actually um, corresponds to the anecdotal stuff that you were talking about, um, uh, Emma Jane. So um, I would just be interested to know um, from the audience um, whether um, the experiences that have been shared by the panellists are also experiences that you have uh, have have personal uh, experience of, and um, what the solutions? Whether you share some of the solutions, Emma Jane listed solutions we heard about how they do things in parts of the Nordic countries. Somebody who has not been spoken yet, the gentleman in the front row there. Hi, um, my name is Frank Shannon. I've been a freelance journalist most of my career, and also a freelance trainer. The last 15 years have been running courses for freelancers through the National Union of Journalists. Uh, many of those have been funded by the Scottish Union Learning Fund uh, so, and, and, and the Scottish Government. Um, I'd like to add to what Robin said about training is absolutely essential. I mean, a lot of what to me is now basic stuff, but things like negotiating, chasing payments, organising tax, organising business finance, personal finance, which is often neglected, um, and also organising and networking. Um, there have been attempts in some countries, including Britain, to misuse the competition law to prevent freelancers organising and um, establishing rates. Um, I, I did a paper on this arguing against it. Our Irish Secretary recently addressed the International Trade Union con uh, Congress. Um, highlighting the fact that it is freelancers can organise, they can, if you like, set guiding rates and so on. I did a course last week for the for the Scottish Artists Union, and they've been very good at setting rates and guidelines for day rates, what they should charge, and so on. So I think, as well as the, uh, if you like, some of the wish lists that's here, um, more training and more resources for training to help freelancers help themselves. Okay, thank you very much. And then there's in the back row. And have we got two in the back row? No, that, it was you that I meant. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, my name's Kate Nelson. Um, my uh, take on this comes from the perspective of working in theatre. Um, one of the things that I think we're talking about, you're talking about fixed rates. I mean, in theatre, we are fortunate in that we do have a number of organisations which do fixed rates. We have equity. Um, equity have agreements with uh, Independent Theatre Council, with um, the UK Theatre, to ensure or to recommend freelance rates. But one of the things that there is occasionally occurring, and it does occur, I think, in Scotland, um, is a lack of scrutiny. Um, in terms of if, a, if an organisation is in receipt of funding um, and they're paying freelancers, that there needs to be a surety that the freelancers are actually in receipt of the industry rate. Um, and I think sometimes there is, I mean, it, it works on a, on, a, on a level of trust. 
and 99% of the time that trust is, is upheld and most organisations that are in receipt of subsidy will work within the industry guidelines. But because there is a lack of, or an absence of audit, um, it is possible and it does happen that that is abused. There's also, I think, with um, uh, some of the statistics we're talking about data, um, recently Creative Scotland, Creative Scotland have produced um, a, a, a review of touring, but also a review of, of the open fund within Creative Scotland, um, and specifically in relation to my sector, um, where they were looking at how many applications within the funding have been awarded and how many have been successful. And theatre has a very high success rate for applications. But what isn't indicated, and we've requested data, is to represent how many of those applications are over 15,000 and how many are under. And I think it's also really important to know how much of that money is being paid to freelancers and how that is characterised as well, because that kind of breakdown is, is going to indicate where that money's going specifically as well. I think it's interesting to find out where that's going to freelance artists. Could I also add, just as a freelancer, um, I also do have a, now have a part-time job, which I took purely and simply because I could not make my, the sums add up with my job. My husband is also freelance. I have two children, and I was the, the principal carer for both of my parents who have dementia. Um, if this meeting had happened two years ago, I would not have been able to attend purely and simply because of when it was timed, because at 6.30 in the evening, you are not going to get a large number of freelance artists able to even come if they have caring jobs. Um, and perhaps if there were to be another opportunity, it would be very helpful to have the timing of this occur at a point in the day when nurseries are actually still running. Um, uh, or, or where people are able to ensure that their partner has arrived home so that they can come. Um, I'm very mindful of the fact that my children are now of an age where I can actually abandon them to the Xbox for an hour in order to get here. But I think that I'm, I'm quite an unusual um, example of, of, of that in terms of parents. Okay. Was there somebody beside you who wanted to speak? It might be. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay, uh, the lady here. Um, I'm not a freelancer. Um, Mairead Nikra is my name. Um, we have a scheme in Ireland which is called the Aestana, and that Aestana supports 250 artists um, with um, a salary basically of 17,500 euro a year. Um, and um, in order to become a member, you have to have shown excellence in some way. And obviously, the number of 250 is confined. Um, but once you get into the ACE Donna, you are there for a period of five years. And you get that salary of 17,500, which is designed basically to allow you to focus on your artwork and not to have to struggle um, with living expenses. Um, after the five years, then you have to reapply. I mean, obviously it's limited, but I think it's a model that should be looked at. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. I would be personally be very interested in hearing more about that. Yeah. I don't know if our panel want to respond to any of the comments so far, or will we? I might just yes. Sorry, I might just add to Kate's point from a theatre perspective. Um, that there are industry rates. Those industry rates don't match up with the industry rates of other artist unions in terms of a day rate, which is actually really interesting as a dancer who often works in galleries. If you look at what visual artists are paid as a day or week rate, that is hugely different to what a dancer is expected to be paid, which is quite odd in terms of cross-working. Um, and a lot of work is not reflected. I work with some of the larger theatres across Scotland Artists are expected to arrive and be familiar with the script or be off book. I don't know who's paying the actors to learn those words, but it's not happening instantly. Um, any of the access opportunities that are offered within those theatres, providing touch tours, um, providing communication with people who are going to do the captioning, that's not paid. The performers do that voluntarily, which to me is disgusting um, in terms of it being an access requirement, that it's seen as a 
fun extra you can do for free. Um, and anyone who works on an agreed or a fixed rate, such as myself who works as a movement director, I don't get overtime. Any work, anyone who's worked in theatre knows that your tech won't run to time. <laughs> um, but when those extra five, six, ten hours are called, I'm still there, the light and designer's still there, um, your sound designer's still there, so on and so forth, who don't get any overtime paid within that. And then on top of that, as a tiny point, Creative Scotland itself states in its open project funding guidelines that artists should be paid for their time in accordance with union rates, yet if you're applying for essential professional development opportunities, you will not be paid a stipend or a fee to undertake those. Um, so you can take four weeks out to do a brilliant course and maybe the costs of that will be covered. But as a working class artist, I can't afford another unpaid month where I've also to somehow pay my rent back home because I'm somewhere else learning something else. So it, it feels like there's support there, but actually in practice, that's really not working in performance. Someone at the back there. Hi, my name's Hannah. I'm from, I'm from UK Theatre. I just wanted to say, we did some research uh, last year, which uh, was UK Theatre and Society London Theatre Workforce Review. And in that, we found everything you set up there largely today was echoed in that. So uh, we're a sector that's largely unrepresentative of the population. People love working in the sector. They're really passionate about it. But one of the results that we found of that is that actually um, there are issues with mental health um, and well-being. So we do training courses on like mental health first aid, but we also recently... Um, launched a theatre helpline, which is a 24-7 independent line where anybody working in any, any part of theatre can ring <coughs> up and ask or talk about. It could be bereavement, it could be harassment, it could be, I can't pay my bills, I don't know what to do, the tax man's coming. It could be anything. Um, and the other point that we all, I also wanted to echo is, yes, training is definitely an issue. So we know that if you're not working, you know, if you're on a training course, you're not working, right? So that, that ritual cycle is also an issue. So we've done things like starting to do pay what you can at different conferences to try and get those networking open and like do entry rates for people that have started into the sector. We also just want to say we only really work on off-stage talent. So as much as we're talking about actors today, we're talking about lighting designers, costume designers, and all of those are people that freelancers that make the theatre sector work or are experiencing a lot of these um, issue so I'm more than happy to supply you guys with that research if you want it and as a result we're working on two main strands of it one is around skills and careers and the pipe talent pipeline coming into the industry um, and then the other part of it is around freelancers and how we support them both practically through things like training courses whether it might be their IOSH their safety stuff or it might be business skills like coming out of university or your T-levels or whatever it might be and ensuring that you're actually work ready. So what is it can we do to support freelancers with that and we're working through that at the moment. Okay. Yeah, Cassie. Um, I just wanted to add something about, I think the, the question of, you know, what is the benefit of, of being a freelancer? And I think for many people it is the autonomy and it is the ability to combine, for many, caring responsibilities with their work and I think in, in, our, in, in my limited experience what seems to be required is a, is a kind of multifaceted approach from the freelancers, from the employers, from government so, so we kind of we tackle it from, from, every, from every possible angle because there is, no one, there is no one way, there are many ways and at the heart of it for me is also that for, for carers and parents the, the things that benefit carers and parents also benefit the rest of the workforce. And I'm thinking about things like flexibility. I'm thinking about job shares. I'm thinking about on-stage job shares, off-stage job shares, job shares at high levels, executive levels. And just approaching every, every kind of, every recruitment, every casting with, from a place of flexibility, of, of kind of going, how can we make this work for you? It doesn't require a bespoke solution for everybody, but it's about having options. It's about how, kind of in, increasing our our palette, you know, and saying, okay, well, what can we do? What is your situation? How can we make it work? These are the policies and practices we have in place. There are, there are we, we devised with our partner organizations a, a best practice charter of, of 10 points, and we've taken organizations through this process, and it, and it really is small steps to start with, but there are practical implementation strategies 
that we can put in place that support freelancers, that provide those networking opportunities, those training opportunities. And it's just a question of maintaining that line of communication between freelancers, employers and government and listening and really understanding the constraints that everybody is working within. Yeah. One of the things that struck me listening to people was <clears throat> some of the solutions um, that are raised fall into the reserved areas of power and some of them are devolved. So in terms of the reserved areas of power, things like minimum wage and uh, working age benefits, pensions, the kind of things that they are doing in the Nordic countries is not something that we could deliver through policy from this parliament. But some of the things that we could deliver um, are things to do with protocols for payment. And I know that the government have very strict protocols when it comes to paying small businesses and, uh, you know, like the government and um, government agencies are expected to stick to those protocols. But I know um, from the feedback that we got in terms of the open project funding and, uh, well, uh, and the RFO funding, but that merged into the open project funding when we looked at it, is that a lot of organisations would get the money and at the point that was raised there, um, there's no real audit of how the money's spent. And I was really struck by what you said, Emma Jane, in terms of, uh, I like the, um, in terms of your list of demands, when you said that there should be a balance between the money paid to artists and the money paid for networking and basically food and drink and, you know, like we all have anecdotal evidence of that kind of thing, but it's never audited. So I think from a, I mean, I'm be interested to hear with people if they've got direct experience of public funding, if they've got any suggestions in terms of how that should change in order to audit it better to ensure that artists benefit. Can I just Jane? say something about that? Um, just with my Scottish Arts Union hat on, we actually contacted uh, Creative Scotland a couple of years ago because we were quite concerned with the Open Fund, uh, just because it's basically one pot of money uh, that uh, individuals apply to as well as organisations. And we were uh, a bit concerned just anecdotally that we were, um, it just seemed like it, it, when freelancers and individuals are pitted against organisations who have, you know, pl 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 paid employees who are used to fundraising and applying for funding, that in a way the, the individuals are, are disadvantaged. So we, do, we did kind of um, speak to them about that. And, and it, I think the statistics were, they were giving us were like one in four of individuals who applied were, um, were being successful. But in actual fact, to um, organizations. yeah, I, I, I haven't got the data with me, so I can't, I can't quote exactly. But I mean, I just think, think for organizations and individuals to be, um, uh, to apply to the same pot of funding is just really quite a, you know, um, imbalanced kind of system right from the, the offset. Yeah, when, when was that you made that uh, point a to them? A, a couple of years ago. That's interesting. Because the, obviously the feedback that the Culture Committee got this year after that FO funding mm -hmm. uh, was exactly the point that you've made because a lot of the organisations that missed out on RFO funding then applied to open project funding and they're of course completely geared up yeah. for these applications and they're competing against artists. And much more like, uh, individuals are much more likely to apply for smaller amounts of money and when you, you realise how competi competitive it is and dif how difficult it is to reapply, I, yeah, I just think things are really stacked against the kind of individual practitioners. Okay. Can I just to say something else about the Open Project Fund. Um, so, although Creative Scotland say that they support um, the rates of pay put forward by the likes of the Scottish Artists' Union, the split in... Um, the kind of cut off between the amount of money you can apply for as what's classed as a small project or a large project has been set at 15,000 for quite a number of years now. So, but given that every year the Scottish Artists Union revise their rates of pay and, and up the artists' daily recommended rate of pay, that effectively means that on a yearly basis the maximum amount of money you can apply for for a small project is less and less. So I think there should maybe be a push for Creative Scotland to revise that figure annually I think and it is anecdotal because 
apparently that's all I do, but I, it is what I do. Um, there's a difference in the language, the way funding for independent artists is discussed, as opposed to organisations, and it's minor, but it's actually huge in lived practice. When regularly funded organisations were unsuccessful in their bids, they discussed their funding being cut. There was a disadvantage to them, something had been done to them. As an independent artist, if I apply for repeat funding or consistent funding through the OPF, my funding is never cut. I am unsuccessful. So organisations have things done to them and independent artists mm. fail. And that perception is massive in terms of not just our mental health and confidence, but in terms of the hierarchy and that place within the sector. Um, and no one I know would agree with some of the things that happened and we were really pleased at the way you tackled some of the systems around the RFO decisions. But there was a massive void where we suddenly realised that as independent artists, we never have that power to challenge, question, shift, change, or just feel like we can have a voice to challenge systems that, as simply put, aren't reflecting things that happen annually. A couple of people in the back row. We could start with someone who's uh, gentle in the middle row. Yeah, we've spoken yet. People who haven't spoken yet. Hello there. My name is Robert Singer. I am running an organisation called Fresh Air. And I think the, or the problems that we have with funding is that we're dependent on money that doesn't really exist. And we need to start thinking about how we earn money. We need to support organisations by creating income sources and income streams. And arts organisations need to take that responsibility of earning money. And that's what we need to start doing. Stop looking at the government to provide the money for everything, but what we do need to look for is the government to support how we can earn the money. In the yeah. back corner there, is Hi, Fiona Campbell. Um, I have the honour of being a volunteer that seeks funding. I'm a freelance contractor at the time, at the moment as well. So I can see both sides of the issue and picking up on um, earning money. Um, one of the things, I was at the Scottish Arts Fair in Edinburgh, or Edinburgh Art Fair, and I was with someone and they said, how can someone charge £100 for a print? And I think everyone's jaw will drop at this point. Um, and I was explaining, saying, well, they're not employed. They have to actually find the money for any kind of illness or pension, as well as also living costs and all this kind of thing. And when I explained that, they went, oh, OK, now I get it. So it's not just politicians. It's actually maybe people, general public, potential customers who don't understand the value that they are buying um, or why that is priced at that level. When you can go into Primark and buy something for five quid, if you, you know, if not cheaper, and then they wonder why something that looks similar to them is why is that 500 or something of those lines. So I think there's actually a value issue that's not just in politicians or organisations, it's actually in our potential consumers. And the other thing I was going to say was... Um, one of the issues is it's great if you get regular funding, but as an organisation, and I'm a chair of an organisation, that would like to be able to offer more stable employment opportunities to people or more stable contracts. But if you don't have that funding, um, there's one project that we have to constantly get one-year funding because we've tried to get two-year funding, as recommended by Scottish Arts Council, for, oh, sorry, not Scottish Arts Council, Creative Scotland, to apply for. We've never been successful in getting the two-year funding, which has allowed us to then plan ahead to look for sponsorship or other employ um, and earning opportunities. So it's not just the freelance side of things, you know, the people are receiving, but it's actually the organisations that want to provide more stable environments but haven't been able to successfully do that yet. So. Yes. Hi. Uh, is this on? Hi, I'm Jean Cameron and I might pass on to Lucy Mason and I hope the independent artists in the room know that we're on their side but we're independent producers so we're bringing that perspective. Um, on, a, on a positive, since Friday afternoon I've raised £25,000 to um, from two, no, uh, there's a point to this, to, from, from, a, um, from Creative Scotland and from a Cultural Ministry internationally to bring artists together for international dialogue next year. Now, 
I'm not paid for that as a producer. There's, there's no money for me in that. Likewise, the, the point that's been made about um, uh, there not being money for training and encounters and dialogues for independence is reflective in that budget. So in terms of one of the things that maybe could be taken on board as a, a policy level, I know that the people in those funding bodies want to fund us, but their guidelines internally are very strict and are preventing them to really have any wriggle room in how they support the individual projects. Secondly, in terms of um, one of the things that could be done is looking at procurement rules. There is a huge amount of um, expertise from independent producers, independent makers, pr practitioners, etc., cetera, um, who can be fleet of foot innovative, entrepreneurial, and reach new markets quickly. But procurement rules at, at a Scottish level really are prohibitive and create a kind of hierarchy where um, larger, and by that it still means small companies, apply on behalf of very able, talented people. So there's an imbalance there that could be looked at. And finally, from my, my perspective as a producer, I think, again, getting to, get to a particular stage in your career uh, um, and riding that wave of fluctuation of, of, of different income levels, uh, the, maybe there's a request to our national agencies that when they're putting together invite lists for um, networking, training facilities, etc., that they, they, they reserve a quota for independence at different eight type parts of their life, the, the, their career life cycle, because um, there is a, the, the, the default position which goes to organisations when actually individuals and in, are, are naturally quite entrepreneurial and fleet, fleet of fruit, so there's something being missing there. I'm going to pass over to Lucy. Um, hello. Oh, this doesn't sound like it's on. Um, so I, I'm a freelancer and uh, one of the projects I just wanted to talk about what I've been doing in Edinburgh for the last three years um, is running a very kind of micro project, if you like, um, called EPAD, Edinburgh Performing Arts Development. And we work on the basis that there are very, very many people who work as performing artists and producers in the city who work independently and who find it very difficult in this city, uh, it's not necessarily unique, but um, it's where we focus, who find it very difficult to make connections and to know who it is within any organisation that they need to talk to, to inquire about having their work seen or finding opportunities to have their work uh, funded or supported. Um, we act as a broker and a facilitator and we use our network to put people in touch with each other. And it's a very simple mechanism, but it does prove to be very effective. And instead of cold calling and inevitably getting no response or uh, a negative response, if somebody's introduced by us to another person with skills, experience, resource, an opportunity or some ideas that may be of benefit to them, that it's more likely that a constructive conversation will flow from that. Um, and we depend on that, it, it, well, the project works because people give their time. So people who sit in the city's funded uh, cultural infrastructure agree to be part of our, our pool of expertise and will spend an hour or so having a coffee with an independent choreographer and sharing a conversation with them that might open up a conversation that goes further and hopefully create some possibilities. And this work came from some research that we did, which was asking people based in the city as an independent artist what it was that stood in their way to realising their potential. And the three things that came back, and again, it, I'm sure not exclusive to Edinburgh, but things that we could grapple with were lack of access to space in which to make their work, um, lack of feeling any sense of a community of part of something, people felt very isolated, and if you have no money or you only have um, intermittent funding, it's very hard to pay for somebody to support you to make your work and bring it to an audience. And I realized as a producer that it was going to be impossible for one or two independent producers to serve all of these artists. So 
a way to do it was to create this network, which is about sharing that expertise. And um, yeah, three years later, I would say it's proven to have an impact and we're looking to continue it. We, can con we do it because we get a small amount of money from the City of Edinburgh Council. Um, I'm very conscious that they think it's a fantastic thing and they herald it all around the world. But to me, it's a very small part in, on a journey for an artist to get their work made and out there. And in some respects, I would rather the council put their money into actually funding artists to, to do that. But um, in, the, in the meantime, I'm happy with doing this project. Thank you very much. Um, could we take the microphone to the, the um, lady from Alvacat? Did you still want to...? <clears throat> yes, I do. Thank you. From all the discussions, it's really made me think, um, and you know, here is a representative of the deaf community and deaf people who use British Sign Language as their first language. The huge barrier is, is communication. And as you're talking about networking, well, exactly. And who pays for the interpreter? And you might think, oh, well, we have access to work and that's a government fund that's available for disabled people. But often that's limited when you're a freelancer and it doesn't cover social events or it's not available after five. So again, it's that case of where there maybe is support, but it doesn't go far enough. And so there's still barriers there. When people are then applying for, for money, I mean, Emma, you talked about the 125 hours, you know, and that's when English is your first language. For a deaf person who uses BSL as their first language and the grammar and structure of that is completely different from English, they would need help with that. And then who do they ask for that help? Someone who's got that knowledge and experience could be a potential competitor. So I think there's another layer of barriers that deaf people experience because of the language challenges. Um, and as Emma said, that, that it can be even worse for people who are disabled. So it'd be nice to consider how we can reach these other groups. Thank you very much for that. And we're going back to the panel now. I'll start with Janie, because I know you wanted to come in. And then we'll, if you want to summarise, you can or respond to anything, but you don't have to. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on, following on from what Jean uh, was talking about there, um, what she was talking about was made me was thinking about um, quite often when we've ended up talking about um, in-kind project, a thing that keeps reoccurring, re and, and it relates to what's just been said there, is that I think just the whole sector needs to be far more realistic and honest about the real cost of art making. Um, you know, uh, the eight, number eight in our, our list of demands is to incorporate the real cost of care into all the plans we make. And um, it's something that we kind of felt we fell down slightly within uh, the in-kind project was not um, incorporating enough funding or um, not applying for enough funding to, to take into consideration um, uh, including um, artists with disability on some of the panels that we were talking about. And, uh, you know, that's something we've really kind of learned from. But I think it's something that the whole sector really needs to look at if we are going to, you know, um, create kind of world-class artwork and within our sector, then we, we need to, to look at the, the, the cost of that realistically. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a big, big kind of topic, but that's just one of the things I think we should... To respond to what they've heard? Yes. Yeah. No, I just want to say that, uh, as you said, that uh, the Scandinavian can, uh, style can't be uh, moved to Scotland like it is. I think I don't think that should work anyway. I think it's the best for Scotland to find our way to do it here. And but I think the safety net is something would be great to get in one form or the other and uh, and also uh, the childcare side of it that it's really for freelancer would be a possibility to have a family and not just one child mm. or max two. Okay, thank you. Okay. Emma. Um, I just want to come to this point of earning money um, because this is a conversation I have a lot based on the fact I'm from a really working class family who don't actually come and watch my work. They're very little engagement with the theatre sector at all. Um, and as long as there's potholes in the road, every time I'm with my family, I have to talk about why I should be subsidised. Um, and there are models across the world where someone is, is earning money creating performing arts. 
In every one of those models, there is someone within the ecology and partnerships of those, apart from maybe Cirque du Soleil, um, who are subsidised. It's a fallacy that this work can exist without being subsidised in a world where so far what we do isn't perceived as having cultural value. On the day that people go and watch theatre, the way they watch cinema, I think it's going to be possible. But that involves a massive overhaul, starting from like preschool children, where the habit of engaging with cultural activity becomes the norm. And I would love that. Like I am an advocate for that through and through. But for years I've been driven to be an entrepreneur because apparently what I should do, what I can do should be able to make money. And it just can't. And that's part of the reason I'm broken is because I'm having to try and fight and find that money all the time instead of just going, actually, my value isn't financial. My value is in performing for that woman who's not left her house for nine years and her hugging me at the end as the first physical contact she's had. And I think that is far more valuable than generating my own salary. Thank you. Ely. Yeah, well, just to add on from that, first, yeah, I think it's really important that the arts are state-funded and that we shouldn't be driven into this profit-making model. The idea that we should all have to start going down this neoliberal corporate route is madness. Um, but I just wanted to ask a question. We were talking about this earlier um, outside. about. So there's a lot about the Scandinavian model that I think is really interesting, but... Um, and I only really have experience of working in Denmark and um, not so much other parts of Scandinavia, but as far as I understand it, there isn't really any greater diversity in the arts in Scandinavia than there is here. Is that, is that right? Um, no. So <laughs> that could be much better. Done. So the diversity, it's, it's very much the same as here yeah. in that, yeah, yeah, it's largely people from a white yeah. middle class background who are working in the arts. Yeah. Well, I would say when you say that your family is not engaging because of working class, um, in, in Finland, where I come from, the theatre came from the people rather than from the upper classes. So we have a very engaging audience and we have an audience that is doing art themselves. But, yeah, but that is just a, a difference as well. But it's not <coughs> diversity, no. Does, does anyone have a view on the Irish example that was raised, the kind of basic income for artists? Um, I know that well, you thought it should be open to everyone, but in Ireland it's, you've got to show that you have a track record and that you've got a commitment to excellence. Yes. And it's limited to 250. Yeah. Mm. And so is there any greater diversity in practising artists in Ireland? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I was going to say, I think maybe with that there's the massive question not for now about who's assessing excellence and how excellence is assessed because until the assessors are a diverse panel of people <laughs> we're not going to have diversity in that 250. I, th I think it's artists themselves you know I think it is people involved in the the business for want of a better <coughs> word um do it. Can, I just, it's can I just can I just in there uh, again uh, just uh, uh, Scottish Arts Union does a membership survey every year and um the one we did last year, we basically came up with statistics that um, over 50% of our membership is now over the age, of, no, over 60% of our membership is now over the age of 50. And it, I mean, I think it raises a lot of questions about um, are younger artists actually surviving in the current climate? And I mean, I could talk for hours on this subject about arts education, so I won't, won't go down that road. But um, uh, yeah, I, I just, um, sorry, I've just I've lost my train of thought there. It's all right. Um, I guess we'll, um, to, to wind up, there have been a lot of ideas raised and a lot of points made. Um, if there are action points that we would like to take forward, um, I think maybe I, if I could make a suggestion is that, you know, we've obviously had an extensive note taken by Jennifer um, and perhaps some of the, the, the kind of like the salient points that were made. Um, we could circulate them uh, around the group. Um, and uh, given that Creative Scotland are having all these reviews just now, I've lost count of the number of reviews that they're having, but I think the open project funding is, is one of them. And I know that they know, well, 
our committee's letter to them, not this committee, but the actual official culture committee, made the point about artists having to compete against organisations. It was made very clearly to them that it was emerging as a problem. So I think perhaps if we fed it into them in terms of the... What do you think, Jennifer? Would that be? And if there are any other suggestions as to who we should feed that into? Can I add about the pre-school level school? That's where we need to target. We need to put effort into creating a culture of culture. Yes. Okay. Can I, can I just... Thank you. The, yeah. What I forgot there was what I was trying to say about um, the, the idea of a universal basic income, which has kind of been mooted by, you know, on quite a lot of occasions, or a citizen's income, is the fact that um, we actually do have <coughs> a universal basic income, which is the old age pension. So basically what I, what I was thinking about there when I was talking about the fact that a lot of the artists that we have in Scotland are potentially artists who are um, putting off an arts career until they're a lot older and maybe waiting until they do have something like the state pension that can actually support them. Yeah. So I think this is something that else. There's, there's sort of different shifts that are going on within the arts. Um, are young artists surviving? Is it just older ones that are managing to make a living and you know making a, a w waiting until yeah. they've, they've re retired before they can resurrect yeah. art careers? So th these are kind of issues that I think, uh, yeah, it's quite a big big issue. Yeah, yeah, because uh, Greater Scotland talks a lot about creating freelance opportunities for freelance. But you know, I know as my partner's an artist, she spends all this time you know, chasing uh, freelance opportunities. She can't actually get the time to make any art because mm -hmm. <laughs> she's exhausted, so. Um, I, just, I just wanted to add to that. So yeah. in, in our research, we, um, we looked into multiple job roles. And one of the things that we found is that, so for example, if you are a musician, it's standard practice to have a, have a day job. That's how you continue yeah. your career as a musician. Um, or, you know, so it's, it's about what is the impact on people who have multiple jobs that they're balancing, and then obviously with the parent responsibilities on top of that. And it doesn't leave you, as you're saying, the creative space to be the artist that, that you yeah. are. Yeah, I mean, I can see universal, a great uh, universal income is obviously, you know, the ideal. But since we don't have all those powers here, yeah. I think maybe would would people be interested in exploring something that was less than that to put forward to Creative Scotland um, as a support for for some artists, even if it can't support all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Up on on funding models. Um, yeah. uh, We've worked with Creative Scotland and the Open Project Fund on quite a number of occasions. And the problem fundamentally is that the, the way in which the funding is uh, developed and distributed is, is fundamentally flawed. Um, it's, if, you tr if you have a heritage-based pro uh, project um, that would involve local artists, for example, on a health and well-being project, you're less likely going to get funding for that because you may not have the artist experience or the expertise to create that funding application that's using the right terminology for an arts-based project. Um, key example is that I was involved in our Creative Scotland application fairly recently, uh, and we had uh, an arts and well-being art therapist on board for the project. Uh, we had uh, an HLF activities uh, coordinator involved in the project. And the feedback that we got from Creative Scotland was essentially we didn't feel that there was enough artistic expertise in the funding proposal. Now, we had an art therapist with 20 years of experience on the, in the project. We provided her CV, we provided her experience. The problem was, was that the project was going to be coordinated by an HLF activity coordinator. So that the problem that I continuously face throughout the sector is that the funding streams are very much on a siloed basis. They're either for culture and arts or they're for heritage, and they rarely actually meet in right. any shape or form. And when you're looking at your cultural development strategy, um, again, it's kind of like it's very much a siloed approach. There's a definition of arts. There's a definition of heritage. But actually, culture is where all of those elements meet. Mm -hmm. Culture is the vehicle for the artistic interpretation, the creation of new culture, the creation of new artwork, and heritage inspires that process. But that, doesn't, that isn't reflected in the funds that are out there. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point, and we, that's one of the points that we'll feed back, and we'll circulate it around the group. So thank you to all our speakers uh, today. If we could just, just show our appreciation again. Very interesting.
We're slightly over time because um, we had more speakers than we usually have, um, but they were all. I wouldn't choose between them, they're all fantastic. Um, but there's a couple of uh, things that we need to action. One is, and I think I'll hand over to Jennifer, we wrote to David Liddington, um, uh, the, um, effectively the Deputy Prime Minister, who's been very involved in the Brexit process, um, after our last cro cross-party group on Brexit's effect on culture and the arts, and I believe he has written back to us. Well... Not exactly. No. <laughs> okay. um, he based, I got a message basically to say that he'd read our letter and passed it to Jeremy Wright at DCMS, right. who has not yet contacted us. So now I have to chase Jeremy um, to find out what the response is, if there is one. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, yeah. we'll wait. It's so. kind of like <laughs> sort of a procrastination is part of the Brexit process, I think, as we all know from watching events in Westminster. The other, the other piece of. Uh, 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 communication that we've had is from the Scottish Glass Society. Now, a few years ago when we had a, a, a session of, about artists, uh, Alec Galloway, who's a glass artist, who used to teach at um, uh, Edinburgh uh, Art School, but is now a, a cultural freelancer, um, raised the whole issue of, of glass in Scotland as part of Scotland's cultural heritage, which is really, really important, but nobody was being trained as glass artists anymore and uh, we thought we'd made quite a lot of progress in it but um, apparently the HND glass production course at City of Glasgow College is closing down which means that the that's it you know it's not been taught in the art schools in, in um, any meaningful way and uh, now this this glass production course is closed and the Scottish Glass Society were wondering if we would give any support to ask the question the college to reconsider their decision. I don't know if anybody's got any views on that. Yes, the lady at the back there. Yeah. has effectively been not exactly removed from art schools and I'm from Glasgow School of Art so I'm not, I'm not against what art schools have done but I think if we're going to build a cultural strategy where making is actually part of that strategy we have to recognise that we have to perhaps have to look again at how we fund the higher education of um, making activities that go into freelance mm -hmm. workers within their own yeah. Would, would the group be okay in terms of um, if, if we just wrote, if I wrote on behalf of the group to the college, but also the, to the Scottish Funding Council, expressing concern? And actually, it was a, it was an earlier, it, it was actually on makers that this issue arose initially. One of our, our meetings on makers, so we could perhaps, you know, like refer back to that meeting and, and some of the points that were made. It's an interest I have as well, so I'll personally take it up as well. But if we could have some kind of communication from the group, I think that would be good. OK. And is that us? Right, well, thank you all for coming, and I now close the meeting. Thank you.